to continue the YPAC podcast at Wets Global. We have Pablo Agrifa from Goagua, who's the um, technical product owner. And we're going to talk roughly about smart sensors, would yeah, you say? Sure. So, what, in your opinion, is a smart sensor? Well, I would say uh, a smart sensor is a sensor which is able to, of course, executing some complex operations locally in the sense that it, has, it may have local capability of decision. Uh, but also, for me, it's very important the fact that you can interact with it in a standard way of communications. Like um, any sensor which is uh, probably advanced, uh, and meaning by advanced, that is capable of measuring some very specific kind of measurement, like it's spectrography or something very hard to measure. So complex organics something, and metals. And, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. But as long as the sensor doesn't expose that information being gathered in a proper way, it's probably also becoming a silo in itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, because we are, we're moving towards, uh, industry is moving towards a paradigm where you want to have everything in a single place. And we're talking about what's about digital twins, about data integration, about big data platforms, and all this kind of stuff. And when you take that scope, you require some kind of standard in the way you collect information from the sensor you have in the network. So you may have an exceptional sensor measuring, I don't know, whatever organic measurement you need to measure. But if the way it pushes the information is using custom CSV files, or using an FTP, or using a, a proprietary protocol, um, it's basically not user friendly from a software development point of view. You require something which is, of course, secure, uh, but also open in the sense that you, you need to interact in a predictable way to that sensor. Maybe some t most of them are only going to send you information. That's fine. They maybe send you uh, collect data. They will send you alarms. They will send you events. They will send you maybe mathematical prophecy. They've been doing locally because they are playing some kind of algorithms, and they would say that's smart. So working on the edge type thing. Working with the edge. That's right. Maybe they can take uh, local decisions, or maybe opening or closing about about or starting or. Uh, stopping a pump or something similar. But when you're talking about this globalization, you need the hyper system to have a very good view of what's happening downwards. And it doesn't mean that the hyper view system needs to control every aspect of the process locally, of course not. But it requires that at least the most important information to know how everything is working. So we've been uh, listening to some uh, mates here in Wex talking about their infrastructure, uh, hundreds of miles, hundreds of pumps, thousands and thousands and thousands of customers. So uh, of course you cannot think about controlling every single point of any single platform at least at the first step for G3, for instance. Uh, but you require those sensors to send you what you need to get a good overview of something. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, the most advanced uh, algorithms or artificial intelligence is going to be running on top of all the information happening in the network. So you need the sensor network to provide the data to, to facilitate exactly. the so, digital twin or, or whatever, whatever it may be. Exactly. So there, there are several concerns regarding this, this, uh, this communication problem. First is that uh, maybe the sensor is really a remote sensor. It's lost somewhere in the middle of a mountain, and there you have a lot of constraints regarding radio protocols. Maybe you don't have 3 G, you don't have to use RS, you have to use something with a low bandwidth. That's okay. But at the end of the day, um, most of the time you are working with uh, big water distribution networks where you have you can't put there something which is able to communicate properly using a radio protocol with like regular bandwidth. So <clears throat> the next thing I would say is that um, 
When you start talking about industrial sensors, uh, well, the PLCs are a mainstream product. Like you, you would probably not use a Raspberry to control a waste a wastewater plant. You wouldn't probably do that in a major city. Uh, but in some cases, this, this, uh, I mean, and, and PLCs, you can consider them like a smart sensor in the sense that you have a programming model you can use there to take decisions, to maybe filter data, to uh, remove uh, spikes and all these kind of things that are not correct and may confuse upper systems when taking decisions. But when you go to IoT, then it really gets uh, a bit messy because every manufacturer is doing its own control system for the microcontroller and the device it has now. So we've been facing it uh, this problem around the years, uh, and it lacks. It, there's still a lack of standardization. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, industry used to have. Uh, like we were talking later before the podcast. We were talking about Mudbus. Uh, you have the OPC Foundation. And I think there's a good chance for these new IoT devices to maybe uh, embrace some of these protocols. Maybe uh, the, this latest, uh, uh, one of the newest specifications of OPC is OPC UA, mm -hmm. which is uh, totally web TCP based. Uh, it's multi platform, it can be run on Linux, it can be run on Windows, wherever it is. You can run it on a microcontroller mm -hmm. as well. So, and that would open the path to the day, which is at the end of what we need. But would that cause a cybersecurity problem? Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, and that's the problem. Yeah. Of course. With a lot of, a major concern. A lot of the ITOT, I mean, in, in the UK, I'm seeing a lot of the ITOT security concerns, because to be fair to the water companies and to the, to the, end, to the end users, there are huge fines. And I suppose around customer data, for example, has to be sacrosanct. I think the challenging and arguable question is, does operational data? To a certain extent, yes, a certain extent, no. So I think there is that, yeah. how far do you go on, on cybersecurity? I mean, one of the manufacturers at the minute, I won't name them, um, is working with a system that you can find out when an instrument's gone wrong remotely. Mm. They haven't implemented it yet, and it, to me, it would, when I was in a water company, it would have been incredibly valuable. They haven't implemented it yet because of cybersecurity concerns. Yeah. But I, I can imagine, and I, I actually said this to a supplier five years ago, six years ago, or maybe more, what I want to be able to do is press a button and find out how that instrument is and have all the data. Now, yes, locally you could do that with heart. Yeah. But sure. say with a heart to TCP IP interface, then maybe you could do that remotely. But again, would it be cyber secure? Sure, for sure. And again, does it need to be? Does it need mm, to be? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, security is a major concern regarding this. I mean, but uh, when you're trying to find your road to these kind of uh, digital applications, you can go step by step. Like we, we face a lot of customers that say, well, we already have a SCADA system, mm -hmm. we already have a legacy system, we already have whatever we have, yeah. and we are controlling locally uh, this facility using this <coughs> system. And that's totally fair. I mean, uh, there's no need to remove that out. Yeah. Just to uh, put the newest technology, the coolest technology, the latest technology. It's too expensive. Yeah, it's too expensive. Yeah. But you can, I mean, for instance, when you're trying to figure out at a high level how a network is working, the amount of data you need is not as much data as you need to control a facility. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you have, uh, you know, in a drinking water plant, you may have. Regular size, maybe one that feeds uh, two hundred thousand people. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe there you have like fifteen thousand variables being measured, mm -hmm. but that includes all the control of the facility has inside. Yeah. So, but when you go to the flows, the pressures, and all the relevant information that maybe a higher level software may may require to build a model. 
you're talking maybe about 15% of that. So that means that you don't need to uh, set remote control to the facility because you already have operational stuff there, which is going to, he's work, they're working there all day, all weeks, all the year controlling how it works, and that's fine. So the first step may be just, okay, let's play some sensorization. If you don't want to touch or, or connect to your already existing sensors, SCADA is not For a limited budget, you can just, okay, let's add new sensorization, which has no control mm -hmm. option, and it's just for monitoring. And just let's let's make a division between what the OT is is uh, the OT network is doing, mm -hmm. just controlling locally that station, that you see, and what the uh, these sensors uh, are going to do, which is monitoring some the key points of the facility to put that data into a artificial intelligence model or mm -hmm. higher level uh, <coughs> control rooms, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there is a mid term. You, you don't need to break in uh, and because you, you you're going to face the uh, the opposition of the uh, OT stuff. Yeah, and, and that's totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand because those that, that people is concerned about making the water flow. So you open your sink and you can drink. Mm -hmm. So and, and that's totally fair. But uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the there is a step by step evolution towards a more unified monitorization and also more unified control because mm -hmm. uh, that's and, and that's the, the first thing we have to do and sensors in that sense in that in all this uh, scope mm -hmm. sensors are very important but, as, uh, but they need to be uh, somehow standardized in the way they it, it's interesting because there's a, something I've been talking about is the instrumentation of sensor life cycle and step one is very much what are you going to use that sensor for? Is it for regulation purposes? Is it for control purposes? Is it in, for information purposes? And information purposes are per perfectly valid because I went to see, see the digital twin, which go I was responsible for. And, and to be honest, I never really understood. I struggled to understand the difference between a digital twin and an operational model. Mm -hmm. I saw saw it yesterday yesterday and saw what it had practically done to, to the local water company and the, the water management in, in the city of Valencia. And it suddenly clicked for me and it suddenly, okay, these are technical people who've designed a technical system to look at that, yes, that short term application, but also you could potentially use it for because they're, they're, they're predicting forward 24 hours, yeah, use it for planning for water resources, so energy efficiency, but also if you then apply that over the long term, use it for asset planning, going, actually I'm using this operational model each and every day, I'm struggling to supply the water, maybe I need to build another water plant, or maybe I need to build another reservoir, another this, another that. And actually, where within the model, if I built a model, if I built a, use the digital twin to build a tank within the system, where would be my most effective point within the system? And there, I think that's where the digital twin technology comes into its own. That's exactly, yeah. Uh, you're totally right. Yeah. I mean, digital twin in Valencia has been uh, for many years. I think my colleagues from Google will tell you better, but it's probably uh, something that has been around uh, maybe 20, 15 years away. And to me, it's probably, it feels to me when I look at it, second or third generation development, or if not, if not more, because it, it's, I've heard of a lot of the digital twin complex co concept, I've never been, I thought it was very much in the hype cycle, and if I was to follow that hype cycle, I would say Valencia has been through that trough of dis dis disillusionment and are actually getting into the, this is a really practical, tangible thing. Um, I think what really did impress me yesterday was when some of the words I heard were, yes, you've got to have your, all your sensors in there properly done, properly calibrated, and you've got to be aware of that uncertainty. 
Exactly. Yeah. It also impressed me, which is something I know uh, another water company in the UK, probably most of them in the UK are doing, it had that d two lines of communication. So it had that redundancy of communication, exactly. yeah. had the protocols, it was all in the right format. So the systems and the sort of level four, level five systems, the visualization and analytics could understand. So that's probably exactly. the. Yeah. And the algorithms could understand, which is something the back work, which it feels at the minute in most of the world that the whole digital transformation, water 4.0, whatever you want to call it, is very much in the hype cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Like Dragon Savage said this morning, actually, artificial is great, intelligence is great. It's not going to solve everything, folks. Sure. So don't allow it. Yeah. to think about it yeah, that's right. so it's I suppose to me seeing it yes it's that instrumentation yes it's that data quality yes it's that transmission but it, yes it's having everything in the right way but also being built upon having a specific application in mind sure which is I think where Valencia have absolutely hit, hit the nail on the head and go I've hit the nail on the head and that's Exciting, that yeah, really is. Yeah, that's, um, that's you're absolutely right with the everything that you just said. Uh, in Valencia, there are, I mean, I think that you've, you've seen the digital twin in the city. There are other digital twins working in smaller towns, mm -hmm. some of them pretty interesting. Um, I saw one presentation from, uh, I think it's a VP of operation from Las Vegas in the city. Uh, utility in the states, and, and and he was pointing out something very similar to running uh, at a lower scale in small towns, mm -hmm. in Valencia, which is basically uh, it's the digital twin at the highest level, mm -hmm. or would you, you would say what well, what what do you want to, this to do in twenty years? So you probably think about something which is collecting data from your network, it's analyzing the data from the network, it's taking into account a lot of parameters, weather forecast, population, mm -hmm. uh, is it today uh, local vacation day in yeah. the town or not, these kind of things. And it will automatically operate the network with a human intervention. You could say, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, kind of scary. You're yeah. breathing like, well, yeah. this is yeah. kind of Skynet or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> but at, <laughs> at, a local, at a local level, that's already running in Valencia as well, because yeah. uh, Digital Twin is uh, automatically operating some of these facilities. Very small of them, maybe just it's just uh, two pumps and a well, yeah, or a tank, and, and that's all. But it's it, what it's doing is uh, taking into consideration the weather. Uh, forecast is also mm -hmm. taking into consideration the water demand for mm -hmm. the population and also the price of energy. Because, you know, most of this, you know, this equipment is really uh, consumes a lot of energy. So, uh, the, you know, the regulation, their, their, the energy contract is based on the price of energy along the day. So, this algorithm is taking this also into consideration. So, it's trying to satisfy. Um, the demand of water, trying to produce that water or move that water into the pumps at the lower, lowest cost as possible. And at the end of the day, that's our operational plan. Like, well, at this time, you should start a pump, and at this time, you should stop the pump. So that would be the first. That's an advanced. That's an advanced scenario. Like, mm -hmm. well, you have. If you are an operator, you have. You know what you have to do. Yeah. Like this is going to tell you in the next 24, 48 hours how you should proceed with the system. Yeah. But in these towns, in these small towns where we have many pilots and some of them are really in production right now, uh, this algorithm is feeding back the system, the hyper level system. Mm -hmm. And transmitting the orders for a starting and stopping pumps, and, and this system is delivering that to the infrastructure automatically mm -hmm. without human intervention. Of course, you can at any time uh, modify the planning, yeah, yeah. intervene, yeah, yeah. cancel, uh, disable automatic planning, disable automatic mm -hmm. uh, transmission of orders, all this stuff. But it's the first little step. Of course, it's not a very complex system, all this stuff, but. Uh, 
to reach there, there are so many, uh, there are so many intermediate steps you have mm -hmm. to, to accomplish. And censoring is probably the first one. Yeah. How do I measure this thing? Because if I cannot measure this thing, how should I model it? How should I know what's happening there? And the sensor you choose is very important. And mm. here, some of our of my colleagues are very good at selecting this kind of instrumentation. Coming, coming back to the instrumentation life cycle, next step is what's the application? What's the sensor? And it, it is, and I've certainly seen it over the years. I've seen the wrong sensor chosen, and it's not because of. It actually wasn't because of the application. The application was right, the sensor was right, but it was how people would interact with that sensor. So it was, the sensor in particular was too complex and really at the end of the day was unmaintainable. Um, I've always said you've got to have the, the two o'clock in the morning test, which is can an operator go to a sensor at two o'clock in the morning and fix that sensor bearing in mind it's probably raining, he's tired, um, soaked to the skin and yes. can't see because it's <laughs> there's no light yeah, out. Sure. Um, and it's a bit of an exaggeration, but there is, I think if you make it in some sense it's too complex, then there's that resistance to, to sure. its effective use, sure. yeah. which I'm, <sighs> there's a great... <sighs> technical discussion around this it's yeah, probably it a, a subject for another podcast but um, to sum up really what's next I would say uh, trying to find the correct trade-off for your application mm -hmm. like you have a lot of sensors to choose some of them with very high capabilities but there's always a trade-off between what you were saying ease of use mm -hmm. complexity supply chain uh, are they prepared for extreme weather condition weather conditions are they prepared for connecting to other systems can they be installed properly can they be can properly? they be maintained because I'm certainly for me installation maintenance and even the most basic sensors I've seen mistakes in their installation and if you're then going to put that into a computer, we get into the, into the situation, of, I think it was back in the 1950s in the American Society of Engineers and garbage in, garbage out, which for me, you just can't have in, in the world of digital twins or in the world of smart water, digital transformation, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But I think yesterday when I saw the digital twin for Valencia, it was that digital twin was for hydraulics within the water system. What's next for them was water quality. What next was what? Certainly, standing there thinking, I was thinking, what's next for the economics? So, do you look at water resources going and put an algorithm in for the water resource cost? Yeah. To say, actually, we've got two sources in Valencia. We'll preferentially use that source. But actually, when it gets to X level, then the cost dynamic changes because yeah. of of it's for example, it's not a sustainable source yeah. to use all the time. And I think there's complex those complex things, complex scenarios that actually the models can help us with. Yeah, sure. Because and I know from an operational point of view, probably at Wall Street and Works, an operator is going to want to go. I'll stick with that source. I know it's going to give me an easy job, but actually, it's not possibly not best for the environment, best for long-term planning, and that's probably where digital twins can can help in quite quite a way. For sure, yeah. There, I'm, I totally agree with you. There's the DOT stuff point of view. Uh, up to date. They don't care about the old twin. No. They, they care about making the procedure run. Yeah. So that means that when you select uh, some kind of sensor, you're not thinking about anything else rather than it's reliable, it's robust, it's, it's I can use it. Economic, it's yeah. Economically, yeah. it's cheap. Yeah. Mm. But when you consider something like a digital twin, you have to take into consideration some of holistic things. point of view, yeah. Same, in my previous personal experience, I worked uh, making uh, monitoring platforms for solar plants. Mm -hmm. 
and we faced there exactly the same problem. Like when you build a solar power plant, what you want it to do is to reduce power. And when you choose the sensors and all the things that you put there, you're thinking about producing uh, solar power. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to monitoring that thing, you realize that you didn't choose the appropriate equipment because mm -hmm. it's closed, it's siloed. You can only control it with a concrete software from, a, from the manufacturer. And when you want to bring it up to a higher level system, which is going to integrate all that information and run complex analytics, complex uh, algorithms, you're blind. Yeah. It's, they're locally exceptional, maybe. Mm -hmm. They're cheap, they're easy to uh, maintain, they have a very nice supply chain, but you cannot communicate with them easily. So once you go to the second step, which is a taking the global, digital twin is very a lot of global vision. Mm -hmm. Like having a global vision of what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's not only about modeling, it's also about getting rid of this old conception of how should I monitor my infrastructure, which is using a local scale system. Mm -hmm. And you connect there using remote desktop on a VPN or something. Mm -hmm. And bring it to somewhere where you use web, you use secretized communications, but you have a single point of access to any part of your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then you can play with the data. Then you can start playing with that and take into account that something happening in one system is going to affect the other system. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the next step. So um, I would say I agree with you. So most mm -hmm. of the time when, when we are trying to select sensors, we're trying to select instrumentation, we don't think about this. Because it's it's not yet in our minds. How how do you interact with the sensor? Is it capable to send this information to the cloud to our corporate system? How do I connect to this? And that's very important, I would say. Uh, of course, they can be as smart as you can uh, mm -hmm. as you want, but you need to talk to them, and, and, and they have to talk to them. Mm -hmm. It's about that interaction. Yeah, yeah. that's it's all about interaction. Yeah. So I think that's probably about all we've got time for today. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to you. Oliver. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And um, I'll speak to you in the, in the forum tomorrow. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.